extra prayer on Yom Kippur. It's called an Elah, special prayer, uh, the end of the day. So uh, spend most of the day in Shul. So, so Yom Kippur is a special day. We also know that Yom Kippur is a day of uh, tshuva, repentance. We say vidui, we do the uh, uh, confession. Confession is uh, uh, one of the most uh, recited prayers on Yom Kippur. Every prayer you say it, it's your personal prayer, then you repeat it with the with the chazans when the, when the cantor repeats it. So these are the, the common, everyone knows this about Yom Kippur. The question is, and this is what we're going to talk about, is what is the mechanism that Yom Kippur brings atonement? What what, how is it? What, what what is the what is the uh, uh, the method? What what exactly is special about Yom Kippur that that Yom Kippur accomplishes something that's unique? So the first thing that I always ask people when I talk about this is: Is Yom Kippur a happy day or a sad day? Happy. Yom Kippur has been the when Hashem forgave the Jews for the Egel, wasn't it? Ah, that's true. That's right. We got the final atonement for the Egel on Yom Kippur, and Hashem gave us the uh, the, uh, the the uh, second set of tablets. Salachti kid varecha. I have uh, yeah. forgiven you, as you as you said, as you asked. So that was uh, Moses, not us. <laughs> What he he only forgave Moses. He didn't forgive us. He told him he's doing as he asked. And what did he ask? He asked for atonement for everybody. For everyone. But so I'm that's saying, it. you know, he answered to Moses. Uh huh. Uh huh. So okay. Yes, Mordechai. And it also says in the Gemara that there were no happier days than Rachamisha Shabbat of Anyam Kepper. Oh, good point. Good point. So uh, Avraham also just said that as well, that it's, uh, but thanks for the source. That's true. That's true. So what's so special about Yom Kippur that it's a happy day? Avraham, do you want to tell us why is it a happy day? Well, because you're hopefully being forgiven for all your sins and everything. And it's like a new, a new beginning. Okay, good. Very Rosh good. So I want to say the name. Just one second. Just one second. Avram, you were the... saying something. Just one second, Ben. What, what were you going to say about Rosh Hashanah, Avram? No, Rosh Hashanah gives us a new year, you know, but the the cleansing of yourself is a whole new, new you. Out of, out of Yom Kippur, you should be able to come out all new. That's correct. So it's it's like a clean slate. You're starting with a clean slate. And um, and so uh, it's um, it's a it's it's a special opportunity. It's a special opportunity. I sometimes think of Yom Kippur as a going into a time machine, and you're able to change the past. You know, if only we could do that with our uh, investments. If we could go into a time machine, that would be incredible. But uh, uh, it's even better to be able to go into a time machine for sins because now we can strengthen our connection to Hashem and fix up all of the mistakes and start on a on a new slate. So it's definitely a very happy day. Yes, sir, Ben. I wanted to say you you said something about the happy day. The name of it, some people say, is like Purim. Like uh -huh. Purim. Right. And Purim right. is a happy holiday. Right. Right. So the thing is, that at the same time, it's a day of judgment. So a person right. shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, uh, sort of like a party, um, uh, but it's a it is definitely a, a very positive day. It's a very special day. It's a gift that Hashem gave us the day of Yom Kippur. So how exactly does Yom Kippur give us atonement? Now to begin, you have to uh, I have to mention that there is a Talmudic argument uh, between Rab Rebbe and the Rabbanon. Do you need to do tshuva in order for Yom Kippur to atone for your sins? Or can Yom Kippur atone even if you don't repent? Because 
we go to shul and we daven. We have uh, prayers that talk about uh, atonement. And uh, but the question is, do you really need the all of the um, um, the methods that we use? in order to get atonement? Or is there something special about Yom Kippur that the day atones? Being, I guess, a participant of Yom Kippur, fasting, and you're, you know, you're partaking of the holiday of Yom Kippur. You know, you're, you're following the, the, the rules of Yom Kippur. So the essence of Yom Kippur provide some level of atonement. So does that require person to, to you know to, to 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 do tshuva and regret their sins and think about their sins or is it enough to you know just uh, you know you're fasting and it's good enough you 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 know you participated in the, the rules of Yom Kippur and uh, the Yom Kippur really atones for you. Yes, uh, Ben. How much how much atonement does the kapara give us? Oh, the kaparas. <laughs> the chickens, you mean? When you do the chicken whatever over your head? You, you, whatever, whatever you, you use. use. You know, that it's might, a, might be a turkey. Yeah, well, the, the, the there is something called kaparas, and for those that aren't familiar with it here, kaparas is a custom, uh, a very interesting custom, very strange custom, and uh, you know that, uh, and it's debated a lot. There's been a lot of ink spilled over this custom, and it's a custom that many Jewish people have to take a chicken and uh, recite a little prayer and say, this should be in my place. And you swing the chicken over your head three times, and you say, this is Zeh Khalifasi, Zeh Tmurasi, Zeh Kaparasi, this is my kapara, this is my atone, this should be in my place. And then you then you uh, bring it to the um, to the shaykhet, the slaughterer, and he slaughters it. And hopefully someone deserving of it can receive it, maybe someone poor maybe gets it, or... Uh, Maybe they donate it to the yeshiva or something, but you basically uh, swing that over your head. So Ben is wondering what type of a kapara you really get from that. It's it's very questionable. The, the question it's very questionable because the whole custom. Now I do it. It's part of uh, it's part of our tradition. I do it. I follow it. But it doesn't mean that it's um, um, well. It's not. It, it's 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 not so easy to understand it because. Obviously, it's not a sacrifice. You can't bring chickens as sacrifices, and we can't bring sacrifices today's day and age. And sacrifices only atone for mistaken sins and certain ones. It's definitely not a sacrifice, because it would be a terrible sin to bring a sacrifice. Um, and uh, the idea really is supposed to awaken in us a feeling of pain, that over our sins, that we see this animal deserves death. This chicken is getting death in our place. It's like we feel like, wow, we should have, we 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 might have been deservant of this, and uh, it sort of awakens, it stirs up in us a feeling of emotional feeling of of regret from our sins and our and our pain. Um, Lately, I've been using tzedakah money. Uh huh. Uh huh. So that sounds to me like a nice, a nicer way of doing it. At least the, at least the animal doesn't have to get killed. Um, but it doesn't bring out the same emotions unless you do a lot. Maybe if you, if someone did all of their bank account, maybe that they would. They say you have to give until it hurts. Until it hurts. Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. For specifically for a kapa, kaparot or in general. No. You give, no. Anytime you give. General, you give till it hurts. So that's an interesting thing. If you if you gave uh, the, for kaparot, you gave uh, uh, till it hurts. Then I could see a little. It stirs up in you an emotion that uh, uh, some people hurt even if they give a little. 
So right. I, you know, maybe right. But, it's up uh, to the person. You know. But there's a difference between hurting and the chicken diet. When you see the chicken being slaughtered, you know, it real it does stir up a little feeling. It should at least. Uh, so it's an interesting custom, and it's supposed to awaken in us a feeling of uh, of uh, humility and uh, uh, pain over our sins and a desire to get ourselves in the mode of uh, regret, regretting our sins and feeling like, look, look at what maybe should happen to us, God forbid. And uh, um, and it doesn't mean that, you know, people here are murderers or uh, we deserve a death penalty for, you know, these, you know, crazy sins or committed adultery or, uh, you know, other sins like that. But what it does mean is we, we might, you know, we have, when you do a lot of sins, that are of the same nature so it does carry with it a much stricter need for punishment you know if you continue and so on and not not correcting it and then of course there are other serious sins that maybe we don't see them as so serious but they are and that is like keeping shabbos and so on and a lot of the laws of shabbos we are sort of guilty of because we should know them better. We should, you know, study them better. It's almost impossible to keep Shabbos properly if you don't constantly study and review them. And so uh, the laws of Shabbos do carry with them other serious uh, consequences. And then there's also, of course, between man and man, if we embarrass someone, that's like killing them. And uh, embarrassing them in public is even much worse. Chilol uh, Hashem is a terrible sin, desecrating God's name which is a, a very serious sin and so on. So in any event, um, uh, the uh, the idea of, uh, number one, the idea of kaparus is not really atoning, but it's more getting us in the mode of, of regret. Um, and so getting back to what we are talking about, um, what is the mechanism that Yom Kippur is, uh, is able to atone and so I mentioned an argument between Rebbe and the Rabbana. And Rebbe holds that the day of Yom Kippur is so powerful that it somehow atones even if a person doesn't sin. It doesn't do tshuva, excuse me. It atones even if a person doesn't repent. The Rabbana, the rabbis say that Yom Kippur is very powerful but it only works if you repent. Now, what is the argument between these two views, the rabbis and Rebbe? According to Rebbe, you don't need atone, you don't need uh, repentance. According to the rabbis, you need repentance. Now, if you need repentance, the question is: so then is there something unique about Yom Kippur? Repentance, repentance always works. What is this special thing of Yom Kippur that Yom Kippur atones? If you're going to need repentance, then, then what do you need Yom Kippur for? So we must say that the rabbis are also of the opinion that there's something unique about Yom Kippur and something special, and it is even greater than the regular tshuva. There's a special element that's the day of Yom Kippur that somehow gives us atonement that tshuva would not reach. Even regret and repentance, you know, tshuva is basically regretting the past sins and um, making a uh, resolution that you're not going to continue sinning. You're not going to do it again. According to Maimonides, it's, uh, it's supposed to be so, so in, uh, sin again. Now, you're so 
um, uh, 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 you're, you're making such a strong resolution that even Hashem will testify Yeid Olav Magid Talumais, the, the one who knows the hidden thoughts, will testify about you that you will never sin. It doesn't mean that you won't actually sin afterwards, but at the state that you're in, when you regret your sin and you're doing tshuva and you're making a resolution on the future, you're really sincere about your resolution to the extent that Hashem will testify, yeah, this guy is not, this guy ain't going to sin anymore. That's, that's the extent. So that type of a tshuva is a very power, that's a very great tshuva, but Yom Kippur is even greater than that. So there's something that Yom Kippur does that's going to that's going to be more powerful. There's something unique about this Yom Kippur atonement that's more powerful than the regular tshuva. Now, again, tshuva you could do any time of the year, any day, you could do tshuva. But Yom Kippur is something special about it. And what we're seeing here is, according to Rebbe, it's very special. You don't even need to repent. You just to have Yom Kippur. Now, Rebbe agrees you can't uh, eat on Yom Kippur and desecrate Yom Kippur, drive, eat, you know, do other sins on Yom Kippur and uh, think that Yom Kippur will atone. But as long as you don't transgress the laws of Yom Kippur and you, you know, you participate, so to speak, in, in the Yom Kippur rules, you uh, follow them, then Yom Kippur will atone for you, according to Rebbe. The rabbis argue, but even they say that, you know, as long as you repent, you do tshuva, Yom Kippur will have this powerful uh, atonement for you. And it, the Hebrew for that is, Itzumai shal yom lechaper, the essence of the day of Yom Kippur atones. The different opinions, actually, if it's the end, the last moment of Yom Kippur, really, where the atonement kicks in, or is it every moment of Yom Kippur that the uh, atonement kicks in? But however you learn it, it's the essence of the day, and it's not the atonement. But the rabbis hold you, it's not the regret or the uh, repentance, but the rabbis hold you need to have that in order for the Yom Kippur to kick in and to work. So Yom Kippur is going to accomplish something big. According to the rabbis, you, you still need the, the, the atonement of uh you know, repentance. You still need repentance in order to uh, to make it work, make the, that the Yom Kippur actually works. Now, how does this all fit together? How does this? How do we explain it again? How do what what is the mechanism? So, number one, we have to remember that Yom Kippur is called one of the ten days of penitence, Aseres Yemei Tshuva. One of the ten days of repentance. Rosh Hashanah is also called one of the ten days of repentance. And what's interesting is, on Rosh Hashanah we didn't really talk about sins much. On Rosh Hashanah we 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 even skipped out a few words. There's a few things that could have mentioned sin, like Ovino Malkenu prayer. We we remove it. Ovino Malkenu Chatanu Lefanecha. At least in some nuschois, they re, in some uh, ver versions of the prayer. They actually remove the one that talks about sin, and uh, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't uh, mention a sin much on Rosh Hashanah. Now Yom Kippur, although the prayers do mention sin and vidui mitzvah, you know, doing that, doing the uh, confession, but the and it's called one of the ten days of repentance, but it seems to have an additional element to it where we see in the Gemara it's called the essence of Yom Kippur atones. So on the one hand, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are both part of the 10 days of repentance. On the other hand, they both seem to have an element in them that's above repentance. Rosh Hashanah, we, we, we emphasized uh, other elements in the prayers, not really about sin and atonement. Yom Kippur we see in the Gemara that it's the essence of the day that atones more than whatever repentance we do. So it's part of the 10 days of repentance, but it's not exactly, um, not exactly, uh, the, the, the emphasis is not exactly on the repentance. Number one, according to Rebbe, you don't even need repentance. 
Number two, according to the rabbis, repentance isn't the main thing. It's the essence of the day of, of Yom Kippur. So it has an element of repentance, but it's not the essence of what the meaning of Yom Kippur is. So it's a, this is a very powerful uh, idea that we're, we're, we're actually trying to understand what Yom Kippur is all about. Everyone runs to Shul. They have this awakening. Yom Kippur, but what is what? What does Yom Kippur really do? Yes, Ben. They also call it Yamim Noraim, the ten right. Yamim Noraim. What, what do they ten. mean? The seriousness of the situation. Well, it's it's a day of awe when you're being judged. It's part of the judgment, so it has an element of of awe to it because it's a it's a yom it's it's a day of awe. I don't know if the if the days in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are called Yamim Noraim. Generally it's Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. You know, the days in between are you know part of the Yaserat Yom Tshuva and mm -hmm. um, many people try to take on special stringencies during these days. But I'm not sure you might be right that it's called but Yamim Noraim. Noraim could be terrible. So no, I don't know what meaning do they want to fire. give to it? What, what meaning do they really want yeah, to I, give to I, it? I, I never understood it as terrible. I understand stood it always as Noiraim as as awe inspiring. Okay. I always think of serious, so I don't know. Uh -huh. Yamim Noraim. But um people do take on extra stringencies. For example, eating pas Yisrael bread. A lot of a lot of people are lenient with having bread baked by, uh, you know, there could be bread that's kosher, but it, but the Jew doesn't turn on fire. Many people are lenient during the year not to, not to have bread, but they're lenient that they, 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 they eat bread. That's as long as it's kosher has a supervision on it, but the, the, there's no rabbi there that turns the fire on. And the, there are leniencies for such bread, especially if you live in an area where you don't have, uh, where you can't get past Yisrael bread, baked by a, by a Jewish uh, baker. So if you can't get it, and so there's definitely leniencies um, for it during the year. But on uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, people uh, generally take on that stringency to only have pas Yisrael bread baked by a, by, by a Jew, a Jew turns on fire. And if you can't, if you're in an area where they don't have it, you could always buy matzah, because most of the matzahs that I'm aware of are all pas Yisrael, they're all baked by a Jew. So, what if you bake your own challah? Then you have no problem at all, as long as your cleaning lady doesn't turn on the, the oven. Right. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people have their cleaning ladies turning on the fire and cooking and cooking up her food and so on. And it ruins your whole oven, actually, sometimes, because the whole oven could be could be great. Now, yeah, Bishal Yisrael cereals is, uh, is, another, uh, is another issue, uh, which is... Uh, which is interesting, but I'm not sure if that is included in the, the stringency on between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Mordechai. Are you are you sure that, that that's included in it? Because there's a difference between Pas Yisrael and Bishal Yisrael. Um, Mordechai? Yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I just know that, uh, uh, well, at least in our house, we yeah, keep, uh, we only need Bishal Yisrael Yisrael between because I thought that it may have been included, but I'm not absolutely certain. Uh huh. The reason why I think it might be different, and again, it's a good thing. I I, keep, I try to keep all my cereals Bishal Yisrael, unless they're made out of corn. But uh, otherwise, I try to you know because corn is edible raw. But otherwise, I try to always have Bishal Yisrael. But I understand there's many leniencies to not have Bishal Yisrael cereals. Um, the reason I think there's a difference between Bishal Yisrael and Pas Yisrael is that Pas Yisrael and Shulchan Aruch, it's allowed. Uh, depends, depend, you know, different opinions as to what's what scenario it's allowed, but it, but it is allowed. Uh, pas, pas Palter, that's baked by a by a baker. Um, so, yeah, of course, it's nice to be machmer all year round, but uh, Bishal Yisrael, it's 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 not allowed. The only leniency of Bishal Yisrael is that it's is that it doesn't need to be Bishal Yisrael because it's not uh, it's not Eilat Shulchan So that leniency seemingly would apply everywhere. You get what I'm saying? The Pas Yisrael, according to according to law, you could you could be lenient if it's a Pas Palter if it's baked by a baker. Uh, so therefore, on between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you could be strict, not not you know, and and, and but the others, are, if you follow the leniency, it's basically uh, permitted. 
uh, you know, if you call, if you consider it not fit for a king's table or you know not baked properly. But I'm not sure. Maybe 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 there is reason to be to be mach. It's definitely a nice thing to do, right? It, it fits into the concept of adding a stringency, Mordechai. It fits into the concept. It's adding a stringency, definitely. Yeah, that's that's nice. I just in Shulchan Aruch, I think it only mentions the pas Yisrael. That's what I was saying, and I think that that's the reason. Maybe. In any event, getting back to where we were, so um, so the Aseres Yemei Tshuva, the ten days of Tshuva, uh, it includes Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yet Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur seem to have an entity of their own that they that they are beyond the Aseres Yemei Tshuva. In other words, that they have an element that's above uh, just repentance. It's uh, Rosh Hashanah. The main thing of Rosh Hashanah is Tamli Chuni Alecha. Make me your king. Coronate me. <laughs> Yom, Yom Kippur is well, seems to have, and what we're seeing here is that it has, let me mute everyone because I hear the noise. Yom, Yom Kippur as well has this element of, it's not about tshuva necessarily. Um, it, it's, in other words, it's that tshuva is not the main thing today. There's an essence of Yom Kippur that, that really kicks in. Now, I don't mean to say it's not a main thing. It is a major part of Yom Kippur. It's a mitzvah of Yom Kippur is the, is the vidui and so on. But what I mean is that there is an element in Yom Kippur that is actually higher we see from the Gemara that it's higher even than the tshuva of Yom Kippur. And that is, itzumoy shal yoim mechaper, the essence of the day atones. So we have, on the one hand, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are part of the 10 days of repentance. But on the other hand, uh, they, they each have an element of their own that overrides, maybe towers above, towers above, I should say, towers above the, uh, idea that they're part of the Aseris Yemei Tshuva. Now, it, which which is interesting because if you think about it, the wording, whenever they talk about the 10 days of Tshuva, they say the 10 days Asara Yomim Shabain Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur that are between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is, uh, which is a strange wording because the 10 days are not between, there's only seven days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur which also hints to this idea that in a certain sense, there's 10 days. On the other hand, the main days of, of atonement, of repentance, the main days of repentance are the seven. You know? So it's 10 days, but the main ones are the, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, um, now how does a sin uh, normally get atoned? So now we're getting into the nitty gritty aspect of atonement. And again, the mechanism is what we're trying to get to. So in general, a person does tshuva. What actually happens? So when you sin, you cause there to be a blemish. There's a blemish in your soul. And there's a something called klipa, which is like a a prosecuting angel. A, uh, a literally, it means a shell. You're you're adding to the shells that are against holiness. You're 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 adding to the klipas, which is the, the other side of holiness, the opposite side from holiness. And so, uh, when when a person sins. They are um, causing there to be giving energy, so to speak, to the klipa, and um, which is basically a uh, blemish in their soul. And by regretting it, what you're actually doing is you are cleansing the soul of the sin of this klipa. And by reciting the confession, you are cleansing, you are cleaning the body of the sin. So there's the body of the sin, and there's the soul of the sin. 
the body of the sin you physically have to remove by reciting words of confession. The soul of the sin is by removing the desire, the enjoyment. So for example, you really love something that's not kosher. I don't know, one of those chocolate bars that are not kosher. So you had a great enjoyment when you ate that non-kosher chocolate bar. How do you get rid of the sin afterwards? So number one is you need to regret that enjoyment. I regret it's not even, it wasn't worth it. I did taste good for that moment, but you know what? I feel terrible about it. I, I really don't want to do it again. And I regret ever doing it. So you're removing the enjoyment of it. And by removing the enjoyment of the sin, you are removing the soul of the sin. Because the soul of the sin is that enjoyment of it. Now, removing the body of the sin is removed when you say the vidui, when you say the confession. So you say, oh, sham, we've sinned. And you think of, oh, I ate that chocolate bar that wasn't kosher. And you say the Oshamnu, and you actually remove the body of the sin and the soul of the sin because you're regretting the pleasure. Now, this is really interesting. You've now gotten, you, 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 you know, this is the mechanism of tshuva, repentance. You're removing the enjoyment aspect of the of the sin. You're removing the body of the sin. And now you're clean. But there's a new there's another level. You could actually make that sin into a merit, into a mitzvah. Because what happens is, you feel bad about the chocolate bar that you ate that wasn't kosher. And you feel so terrible. How could I, how could I, you know, do that being Jewish and Hashem give, gave me so much and I have so many blessings that Hashem has given me. And I went and I did this sin. And you say, you know what? I, this is, this was terrible. I feel terrible about it. And I want to, and, and, and you know, I have, to, I have to come to the synagogue more often because, you know, if I maybe hang out more in the synagogue, I won't come to sin. Or you come up with, you have this thirst for God, stronger thirst. So the sin becomes a springboard for your strengthening your relationship with Hashem. And by the, by, by the sin strengthening your relationship with Hashem, that sin in a certain sense is like a merit. Because before the sin, you didn't have this strong relationship with Hashem. And now that you sinned, it strengthened, it encouraged you to want to get closer. Because you're hungry and you feel terrible. I'm not going to play with those guys anymore now. I'm keeping Shabbos. I'm not, to, you know, you, 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 it, it awakens in you this, this desire to, uh, to strengthen your relationship with Hashem through the sin. And, and so it's, it, 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 it becomes a, an impetus for your, for, for your, for your mitzvahs. And therefore the sin turns into a mitzvah, which is an interesting vart. It's an interesting insight. I always uh, tell my family on Sukkot that it says on Sukkot, is the beginning of the the calculation of, of sins because until sukkahs you're busy building your sukkah you're busy uh, buying lulav and esrog, you're busy with mitzvahs so the beginning of sin start on sukkahs so the question is asked i believe it's from the believe yitzchak of berdichev he says if before sukkahs if before sukkahs you were busy doing mitzvahs, so you don't have any sins. You don't have time. How much more so on Sukkot when you're doing the actual mitzvah? You're not just buying the mitzvahs, but you're not just buying the lulu of an esrog. You're not just building a sukkah. You're actually doing the mitzvahs of dwelling in the sukkah. How for sure you're not going to come to sin. So how could the sukkahs be the beginning of sin? The beginning of sin should be after sukkahs. Why does the, the Talmud say, Rishon hu l'chesh b'navayin, his sukkahs is the beginning. So Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, he says, 
He says a beautiful insight. He says, before Sukkot, you're doing tshuva on sins from fear of Hashem. On Sukkot, your repentance is out of love of Hashem. So when you reach such a level of love of Hashem, your sins turn to mitzvahs. So what it means is that not that you're that you're uh, on, on Sukkot that you start doing averus, you start doing sins. It means that on Sukkot you start counting the sins of how many good deeds you have because the sins are now turning into mitzvahs. They're turning into good deeds because you're doing you're loving Hashem from the sins. Because you felt so so disconnected to Hashem on Sukkot, you awakened in yourself that love for Hashem. Because Sukkot is, is is a day of sim, is a time of real simcha, real joy. So it awakens in you this time of love for Hashem that it's uh, that it turns all of your sins into into mitzvahs because you feel so connected to Hashem. The sins made you this way. So the sins awakened in you this desire to get closer, this thirst, this hunger for Hashem. So it turns into mitzvahs. Anyway, that's just a little insight about sukkahs, which is a beautiful little uh, vart, nice uh, little insight into sukkahs. But the idea that we're mentioning is that the mechanism of tshuva is that you regret the enjoyment, the soul of the sin, and the body of the sin is removed through saying words and banging your chest. You say the the the, the confession, and that that destroys the body of the sin. And ultimately, it cleanses you from this sin. Now, um, the, 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 this is a very nice insight into repentance. The question that, that we really need to know is, how does Yom Kippur atone for sins if you don't do this repentance? According to Rebbe, you don't need to do repentance in order to get this atonement. Your atonement comes automatically on Yom Kippur. According to the rabbis, you do need to do some type of repentance, but the main element of, but Yom Kippur has, a, has an element in it that towers above the repentance. So how is that, how is that uh, towering over your repentance? Repentance, I understand. We just explained that you're cleansing yourself from sin and uh, fixing, you know, fixing the blemish. But the actual uh, atonement of Yom Kippur, you're not doing anything. You're ready. You did your confession. And now Yom Kippur itself, it says, somehow atones. What do you mean? What's the mechanism? How could Yom Kippur itself atone? It's, it, it, you know, we have this blemish. I, it, now, if you want to say that it, 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 it removes punishment, okay, that's fine. I could, you could, I could hear that. Special day. The king has a special occasion. He says, you know what? No more punishments. I'm not punishing anyone. I, my daughter just got engaged. I'm not, uh, you know, we're, uh, uh, we're letting out uh, people. We're, we're, we're freeing uh, people who have, uh, you know, white collar crimes. We're letting everyone go because, uh, you know. So it doesn't remove the blemish, but it removes the punishment. That, that I could ask, Yom Kippur, ah! I'm making everyone, we're letting people go, go free. Yom Kippur, it's a special day. Hashem is excited. Moses, uh, uh, you know, 2,000, uh, 3,300 uh, years ago, came to me in heaven and, uh, you know, made my day. This is a special day. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm free. I'm letting everyone go free. No, no punishments. But how does it cleanse the, the actual sin? the actual blemish that's in that's connected to your soul. So in order to answer this, um, you need to understand that there's, there's special connections that we have with Hashem on different levels. On the one hand, on a simple level, there's the connection to Hashem that we have through doing mitzvahs. God says do this, and we follow the commandments. So we are now connected to God. If we didn't do the mitzvah, we wouldn't be connected. But by doing the commandments, we actually connect with Hashem. Right? That's a very simple way of connection to Hashem. The connection that we have through accepting the yoke of Hashem on us and through doing and following his commandments, we've now created a connection with Hashem. Then there's a second level of 
connection to Hashem. And that's the concept of tshuva, where you sin. So because you sinned, you don't have the initial connection to God because you didn't do the right thing. We sinned. We transgressed. So we don't have that connection to Hashem through, through fulfilling the mitzvahs. But because we do, we're doing tshuva, we're repenting. So the concept of connection to Hashem through repentance, it is, in a certain sense, it transcends mitzvahs. Because we can, Hashem says, I am giving you the opportunity to repent. That connection to Hashem is a very unique connection because it's 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 it 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 it's a transcendental relationship. It transcends uh the element of commandments because even though you sinned, Hashem says, I still want a connection with you. Do tshuva, I'll connect with you. So the Jew does tshuva and he connects to Hashem on a level that overrides the commandments. So it's in a certain sense it, it transcends the commandments. It's a level of tshuva. It's a level of, of uh, it's, a, it's an attachment to Hashem that's higher than the mitzvahs. Now, how do you reach that relationship with Hashem? That relationship with Hashem is created through your action of tshuva. Then you have a third level of connection to Hashem. The third level of connection to Hashem, and this is going to touch upon Yom Kippur, not just touch upon, this is going to be the real the, the real meaning of Yom Kippur, the third level of Hashem, of relationship with Hashem, is because the essence of our soul is connected to the essence of God. That connection that we have is a level that transcends everything. We don't have to do anything for that. God chose us. We are Hashem's people. Hashem gave us a neshama. Hashem put that neshama, that soul, into our body, and we are one with Hashem, as we say in the in the actually we say it in the in the Peshanos on Sukkot, Yechida leYachadov, Chavuko Dvukabach, like this oneness, this unique oneness that we have with Hashem, that we are. Uh, that 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 our soul is is totally attached to God, and of course, as a on, a on a very simple level, we always say the neshama is a chilek. It's a part of Hashem. It's a it's a portion of God. So we are internally and essentially connected to Hashem in a way that transcends not only mitzvahs but it transcends tshuva. Because this concept is not dependent on, on our connection and what we do. It's totally coming from Hashem. It's a connection to Hashem that we have. That's, 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 that's coming from above. It's not because we fulfilled Hashem's mitzvahs. It's not because we did shuvah on our sins. But it's a, it's a, it's a level of connection. It's a, it's a, it's a hiskashos. It's a connection to Hashem that overrides uh, any uh, element of uh, that 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 that's uh, connected to the world. It, it's 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 beyond the world. It's a, it's a, it's it's it. Nothing can break it. Nothing could could destroy this connection. We are connected to Hashem in a, in a in an eternal way. It's almost like a parent. Whatever the child does, the parent still is going to have love for the child. There's some level of love, as bad as the child may be, uh, and he might do some you know crazy things. But the parent always is a love that a parent has for a child, and so that idea is uh, this uh, that that's the idea of Yom Kippur. Now, uh, what reveals this level of attachment to Hashem that overrides the mitzvahs, the commandments, that overrides the even tshuva, the towers above tshuva. What, how do we reveal that love? So that love, that relationship, that connection we have with Hashem is revealed on Yom Kippur. According to Rebbe, you don't need to do tshuva. It's the day of Yom Kippur has that. And in a certain sense, we sort of feel it. People who never go to shul, for some reason on Yom Kippur, they pop into shul. 
there is some element of Yom Kippur that 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 awakens a connection that we have with Hashem. However, the rabbis hold that in order to really reveal that level, it's only revealed if you do if you if you if you um, in other words, in order for it to be revealed in you, you need to repent. Rebbe held no, even without repentance, as long as you, you don't transgress the laws of Yom Kippur, you know, that, that level is revealed enough. The rabbi said it's not revealed enough in order to remove your sins. In order to remove your sins, that level has to be more revealed. So how do you reveal that? According to the rabbis, as long as you do tshuva, the essence of Yom Kippur will, re, will, will be able to uh, be considered enough of a revelation for your sins to just go away. So according to the rabbis, you, you, you do need tshuva, but it's the essence of the day. It's a much deeper connection to Hashem that's causing the sins. It's like there's no, there's no such thing as sin. What do I mean? Let's think about this. this is a very deep concept. Before we talked about tshuva, repentance, how it cleans the blemish. Tshuva cleans the blemish. You, you did a sin. You enjoyed the sin. Now you regret that enjoyment. And now you re remove the act of sin. And, um, uh, and you got atonement because you got rid of the blemish. Here we're coming up with a whole new idea that it's not that you're removing the blemish of the sin. It's that the essence of Yom Kippur is revealing, it's a, it's a revelation of a connection to Hashem that sins mean nothing, that th there's no blemish. That's not a blemish. Your, your relationship with Hashem is, is so much deeper than that. Oh, you sinned, you did this, you did that. This is my son, Hashem says. This is my son. Uh, it, 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 blemish, sin, what, like what, how, does that, how does that play a role? Here we're dealing with, a, a, with an essential connection that, that is um, much greater than any sin could, um, much greater than any sin could ruin. So in a certain sense, this relationship with Hashem, it, it, when it's revealed, it removes anything that blocks the relationship. So in other words, the, the relationship itself is what removes the sin. Because this relationship is on a deeper level that sins mean don't, don't mean anything. There's no such concept. It's, it transcends the element of you need to do mitzvahs. It's a, it's a relationship that, that overrides that. And therefore, anything that might block it is automatically removed because the connection of Hashem, so to speak, removes anything that might be that might be blocking it. So you need to have you need to to channel in in order to absorb this relationship. And how do you channel into that? How do you connect with that? You connect with that, of course, according to the rabbis, you need to do tshuva, which is the halacha. You need to you need to repent. But once you repent from your sins. The Yom Kippur element, it connects with you. It 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 it, it awakens in you this. It, it it becomes revealed this relationship you have with Hashem that 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 nothing else matters except you and Hashem. You are one with Hashem. And um, uh, this is the concept of the Kohen Gadol, who is the emissary of the Jewish people, entering into. the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. And no one else is allowed to enter, even the angels, it says. Even the angels are not allowed to enter the Holy of Holies when the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is, is uh, when the high priest is uh, entering the Holy of Holies, only he. It's only him and Hashem. No one else. It's that revelation, that relationship between him and Hashem. And what's really interesting is that in the time of the second temple, 
Even the tablets were not in the in, in the in the holy of holies. That means even the Torah, and this is a relationship that transcends even the Torah. In the second temple, the Kohen Gadol, we, we were missing the tablets. In the second temple, it was missing five, five elements of holiness were missing. And one of them was the tablets were not there in the, uh, the, in the Holy of Holies. And so the fact that the Kohen Gadol would enter into the Holy of Holies without the tablets is a... Um, uh, it's a uh, um, expression of the Jewish people's relationship with Hashem that is like a tshuva, the repentance. It's an atonement that transcends even the Torah. It's a it's it's a very uh, high level of connection to Hashem, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is the the concept of of Yom Kippur. And the, we don't have a base on Mikdash, but our tefillahs, our prayers, are in place of the base on Mikdash, place of what was done with service in the temple. And one of the main prayers on Yom Kippur, or the most important prayer on Yom Kippur, is the prayer called Ne'ilah. Ne'ilah means the gates are closing. Now, the simple meaning of this prayer is that we try to push in our final prayers into uh, heaven before the gates close. That's the simple meaning. But there's a deeper meaning to this concept of Ne'ilah. Ne'ilah is connected to the essence of the soul. The soul has five levels. There are five prayers on Yom Kippur. Mayriv, the night prayer. Shachris, the morning prayer. Musaf is the additional prayer that we have on all holidays, Shabbos. So there's Mayriv, Shachris, Musaf. Then you have Mincha, the afternoon prayer. And then you have Ni'ila, which is this closing of the gates. And that prayer, Ni'ila, is considered to be the holiest of holy prayers. It's like the highest level, the end of Yom Kippur, the final prayers, the final moments. And that prayer is connected to the fifth level of the soul, the highest level of the soul called Yechida. Yechida means oneness, the unity between the Jew and Hashem, the highest level of the soul, or the essence of, of the soul. And so that level becomes one with Hashem during the Elah, meaning, it, meaning we connect to Hashem on that level. That level is revealed. Not, not that it becomes one. It, it's revealed. It's always one with Hashem. But it's revealed, that level is revealed on at the time of Ne'ilah. And the meaning of Ne'ilah that we're closed in the gate, that the gates are closing, is that we enter into those gates. For Ne'ilah, it's just us and Hashem. That, 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 that the Jew and Hashem have this moment of the essence of, the essence of the day that atones. So that's the concept of the itzumai shal yoy mechaper, the essence of the day that atones, is this um, this moment, this time, that we find ourselves in a revealing, in a, in a revealed way with this relationship with Hashem that transcends everything else in the world. Nothing in the world means anything except us and Hashem, and that's the concept of Nila, and that is the concept of the, the, the cleansing, the breaking away of all sins, that anything that might that might block us is uh, immediately removed. And, and we're able to connect to Hashem on this great high level. And that's the, that's the holiness of Yom Kippur. And now if you, know, if you thought of Yom Kippur as just walking into a time machine, it's a lot greater than that. It's this, uh, the holiness of Yom Kippur is a, is a huge, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the holiest moments where we can uh, connect to Hashem on this extremely high level. And, uh, and, um, and the truth of the matter is, it's not just during the prayer of Ne'ilah, but it, there's an element of it throughout Yom Kippur. But of course, it's more revealed at the end, the, the, the day of uh, the, the time of Ne'ilah. And, um, and may we all uh, be atoned for all of all, all of our sins and reach this level of relationship with Hashem that's uh, in a revealed way where we feel that connection to Hashem in a very strong way. 
and may we be blessed with a really good year and with all, only good things revealed good and, uh, and every, whatever anyone wishes should be for the good should 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 be fulfilled. Zai gesund, everyone. Have a Thank wonderful you, evening. Rabbi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.